Hey, I'm super excited today to be talking about HCP Waypoint and how it can act as an internal developer platform. You've probably seen me talk about internal developer platforms before, or maybe you saw the original launch of Waypoint a few years ago. But I want to talk today about how Waypoint has evolved to really act as an internal developer platform. What does that even mean? What is an internal developer platform? And you know, where does it sit in terms of solving some of the challenges of doing cloud delivery at scale? So with that, I want to jump right in. So when we talk about Waypoint, I think it's important to first put it in the context of what is an internal developer platform and what's the goal? What are we trying to solve for? Right. So at a high level, the way I like to think about it is what's the interface between our developers and their concern, which is really more around application delivery, application lifecycle, and our operators or our platform teams who are responsible for the underpinning infrastructure that our applications run on top of, right? So we can think about it as these two groups obviously have to work closely together. The applications run on top of that infrastructure. There's naturally an interface between them. But oftentimes it's kind of blurry. It's kind of messy. It usually lives within sort of a, a CI CD pipeline where it's not really clear where the developer concern ends and the operator concern begins. And so I think one of the key goals of an internal developer platform is to cleanly separate that. It's to really position as a layer that sits between the developer concern and the operator concern so that we can draw a hard line and say the developer is really a customer of this layer, the IDP layer. And everything below that is really the operator's concern in terms of defining how the actual platform operates, right? Now, the platform shouldn't own everything. Not everything gets kind of subsumed by this. Oftentimes, developers want to still own the pre-production pipeline that goes from, you know, version control through their sort of CI pipeline, you know, and then from there it might connect into something like the IDP. So you might say, great, I'm using GitHub or GitLab or something for my developers. They're doing their dev test in sort of a classic way. But then when it touches saying, okay, well, now I'm ready to deploy this app into a production environment, that tends to be the key touch point, right? And I think the real challenge when you start to touch production is there's an explosion of tools, right? That might be where it's like, now I have to learn Kubernetes and a YAML specification. I have to configure my Argo. I have to use Terraform to you know, spin up a managed infrastructure. I have to set up my Datadog dashboards and PagerDuty alarms and so on and so forth. So you start to see this explosion the moment you sort of leave dev test land. And the goal of the IDP is to sort of abstract that away, right? As a developer, they don't really need to know what's happening in sort of the messy underneath where it's like it might be running with a whole bunch of different you know, components that we need to deliver our applications. But all of these are sort of a detail from our application perspective, right? So when we start to say, okay, well, this is at a very high level the way I would think about an internal developer platform. It's about the interface between developers and operators. It's about an abstraction layer that hides the infrastructure and allows the developers to focus on their business logic. Most of the time, it is not meant to be a replacement for what you're doing with your version control or CI CD. That sort of sits to the left of it in sort of dev test land. So now what is the sort of high level concepts that start to matter, right? And so particularly, if we think about this in the context of Waypoint, there's a few key important concepts that we talk about, right? The first is this notion of like, do I have a service catalog or an application catalog of what are all my different applications that are running, right? Meaning I can come to this thing and define a new catalog, right? So I might say within my organization, you know, I can define a series of projects. And then within those projects, I can define a series of applications, right? Application, you know, one to, you know, application N, right? And just for the sake of it, we might say this is app foo, for example, right? So first of all, do I just have a catalog where I can just say, what are my applications? I, do I have foo bar and baz? Is there 10 of them, 50 of them, 1,000 applications? Like, what are they, right? So that becomes the first level thing. It's like just providing that high-level service catalog, right? So I might start by describing it this way. Now, that on its own is not particularly interesting. There's probably a million ways you could solve that. You could just have a spreadsheet. I think it starts to get interesting where you say, okay, but how do I connect that catalog into the operational rhythm of how these applications are actually built, deployed, and managed through their full life cycle, right? So if I come in and say, great, I want to create a new application, Foo, and Foo is a new Java application, well, I don't want every one of my Java applications to be a special snowflake that's defined differently, built differently, managed differently. Ideally, what I'd like to do is define a set of golden patterns, right? where those golden patterns might define something like, let's say, a Java app. 
such that all of the new versions of that follow the same pattern. If I create a new application bar and it's also a Java app, it should look functionally identical to Foo because this gives me a consistency of management now for my operations teams so I don't have to manage every one of these applications in a unique way, right? So great, we wanna have this concept of a golden pattern. How does that literally work with something like Waypoint? The way it works is we integrate tightly with Terraform Cloud. So within Terraform Cloud, we're gonna go ahead and define a set of modules. So with Terraform, you can obviously write Terraform configurations, but you can also write Terraform modules, which are reusable libraries of capability, right? So within my registry, I can define and say, great, I'm gonna define a pattern that's a Java application, right? So this is often written and managed by my operations teams. They're gonna define and say, great, we have the Java pattern. Here's how it works underneath the hood. Maybe it's a Kubernetes cluster and we have you know, a load balancer in front of it and there's a scaling mechanism and we're tying into some default metrics that we wanna monitor and we create a Datadog dashboard for it. So we can wrap up all of these different things that we're concerned about, right? We use Terraform to define it, run it on Kubernetes, pre-wired into Datadog and PagerDuty with some sensible thresholds and alarms and dashboards. But our developer doesn't need to know anything about that. They can just come in and say, great, I'd like to consume this pattern, right? And say it's a Java application. And then this template gets linked to this pattern, right? So when we define the set of patterns, we basically can create a linkage between these that are defined within Terraform modules and then in Waypoint, what we want to expose, we're going to call this a template. So the Java template will be linked to the Terraform module in this case, right? And so now we can come in and instantiate Foo, and underneath the hood, what Waypoint is doing is it's going to create a new Terraform workspace for us, and it's going to provision based on that linked module definition. And then this application gets linked to it. So we can say, great, this might be workspace one, and then we maintain that linkage that says, yeah, application foo, by the way, is linked to workspace one, which is instantiation of that Java template. And this can then be customized. We might be able to say, for example, you know, maybe I parameterize this and say, is it a small, medium, or large application? And maybe what region it's in, things like that. And so when we define application foo, we can also define and say, well, this is an instance of a small cluster and that will flow all the way down to the Terraform execution, where then we can take that variable and based on that small, medium, large, define the infrastructure appropriately, right? So that's great. This gives us at least a baseline. If I can create a catalog, I can say I want to create application Foo, Bar, and Baz. They're all Java apps. And I can define them in a consistent way based on an infrastructure as code pattern managed with Terraform. Now, oftentimes, it's not, not just enough to say, well, it's just a Java app. Well, okay, great. Doesn't that Java app need a database? Maybe it needs an S3 blob store. Maybe it needs a Kafka queue to do message passing. There's usually a bunch of other pieces that surround an application. Rarely is it just the application on its own. So building on the same notion of a golden pattern, you can templatize these add-ons is how we think about them, right? So if my core app is the Java app, why well, might have an add-on for Kafka? And I might have an add-on for, you know, Mongo. And I might have an add-on for, let's say, Redis, right? So all of these, once again, get defined as Terraform modules, right? So we can define them in a repeatable way. It's as code. We can modularize them to say, okay, are they all small, medium, large as their inputs? You know, do, how many different, you know, topics do I need for Kafka? Things like that. And so now when I define it, it's not just the template. I can say, great, not only do I need the Java template, I also need the Redis add-on. You know, this is an add-on to basically the core template. Plus I want Kafka, plus I want Mongo, right? And so now if the developer specifies that, they again don't need to know how this works. What Waypoint will do is instantiate the additional workspaces linked with the right variables to basically import and create all of the sub pieces of infrastructure that are needed. And then similarly, all that gets linked to the application. So I can say, great, I have workspace one, Sorry, that's Java, Workspace 2, great, that gives me my Redis, you know, so on and so forth, right? So now I can have a, the sort of visibility if I click into Foo to say, hey, what are all the resources associated with this application? I can trace that through to, great, I know what are the sub-Terraform workspaces, and then what are the other, you know, underlying resources that are being spun up in support of this application, right? So I get the service catalog, which is really more about providing me that consistent metadata. I know about what are all the applications, what are all the sort of workspaces and resources associated with it. But I also get these golden patterns, which let my developers come in, quickly provision these things without having to be expert. 
And the ops teams gets to have a standard set of templates for how they're building and maintaining these things so they don't have to have you know, a million unique snowflakes. Now over time, inevitably, there's a life cycle management to this as well. It's not just great, I created the Java app day one, I'm Redis and Kafka day two. Over time, I'd say, well, there's a new version of Java, right? So now I publish a V2 module because there's an update to the JDK or there's a security vulnerability or whatever. I want to then be able to go patch all instances of the application that are using this Java template. So this is where a waypoint really starts to help is great, we have applications running at scale, there's 50 apps using the same Java template. Can I now have a consistent way that I'm going and patching and upgrading all of those things, right? Same thing could apply to my, let's say Mongo, there's a new version of Mongo database that comes out, I need to go do the same thing. So it's not just the day one problem, it's that day two, day three, how am I patching, scaling, maintaining, you know, upgrading to new versions, et cetera, right? So this core becomes sort of golden patterns, it's a mix of both templates and add-ons. Now in a reality, most applications, you're not just deploying the app and then you're done. There's usually a set of actions associated with it, right? And sometimes these get baked into pipelines, oftentimes they're ad hoc. You know, even, you know, commonly you might see developers have to SSH in and manually execute commands in a production environment to do different things. But some of the actions, for example, just to make it more concrete, right? So if I talk about golden patterns and golden actions, or sometimes you might call them golden workflows, Right, so it might be a, the workflow and then there's specific actions that we'll define. So for a Java app, for example, you might say I have you know, three common ones. I build the application as an example, great. I have code that's sitting in my you know, version control pipeline, it's passed all the tests, but now there's a formal build. I need to compile the artifact, build a container, push it into artifactory, version it, you know, maybe replicate it to multiple uh, you know, data centers around the world, et cetera. So the build is a discrete action. Then I might say, okay, great, I've built it, now I wanna deploy. Great, so I might build that says, hey, version five artifact was built, now I wanna go and deploy and say deploy version five. That might go well and great, we look at our Datadog dashboard and everything's looking good, but it might also go badly. We might deploy it and all of a sudden we see, hey, every request is generating a 500 error. You know, we've pushed a bad build, we gotta go do something about it. So you might have a different action that's a rollback, for example, right? So these might be opinionated actions Right, that we want to define as part of the pattern to say, great, the Java pattern supports a build, deploy, and rollback action, right? And again, these might use a whole mix of different tools, right? The build might be, you know, Java native tooling, and maybe it's Docker tooling to build a container, and we're pushing it to Artifactory. Deploy might be we're using Argo, or we're using, you know, Terraform, or we're using something else. You know, rollback might be again using those tools, but in reverse. And so the key becomes from a developer standpoint. They shouldn't have to see that. You know, how the sausage is made becomes a detail. They should be able to log into Waypoint, push the build button, not really have to care how it works. While the ops teams, platform teams, they should be able to control how these actions work. And these actions aren't just meant for sort of core templates. You might say similarly for Redis, I might want an action that's, you know, you know purge my cache. You know, if I'm using Redis as a caching mechanism, right? Maybe for Kafka, I similarly might want to purge a topic, right? If I have it as a runbook, you know, action, you know, maybe my application's backed up, it's not processing transactions correctly or something's corrupt about the queue, how do I quickly go in and just purge everything in that topic, right? Same thing with Mongo, maybe I wanna come in and I need to do something like, you know, rebuild an index or something. Or I need to force releasing certain locks, right? So there might be various sort of database operations I wanna take that are sort of part of a run book of operating that service, something's not going wrong, performance isn't the way we think it is, we need to trigger some action. I don't necessarily want my developer to SSH into production and run this command you know, directly against the database where God knows what other commands they might be running, or maybe they're not familiar and they run the wrong command. So those kind of things, how do I capture those run books in an opinionated way, package them and attach them to the pattern, and then they get exposed as an opinionated action that the user can you know, express because great, the Foo app happens to import Redis, which means they have access to the purge cache action basically, right? So then when we sort of take a look at this, what we're really trying to do is a few things. We're solving for a few different constraints. One is for our developers, you can see that the key focus when we talk about golden patterns and golden workflows is I wanna enable them to go quickly without having to be experts on how the system works, right? The details of how the system operates isn't their concern. It's about, well, what's the life cycle goal I have? I wanna build my new you know, Foo application. I want to extend it by, you know, great, next I wanna add, you know, Elastic to it, 
So I want to add Elastic because it's a new capability I'm building in the app that needs search. Okay, great. I don't want to have to care how do I provision an Elastic cluster and configure it correctly. Not really what I care about. I just want to say that's an additional add-on I need. And my ops team can define what's the template for bringing up and spinning and managing an Elastic cluster. So that's the value up here. For the ops groups, it's really about how do I do this in a consistent way at scale, right? I don't want to have to manage Java and Kafka and Mongo and Elastic in a unique way times 50, 100, 500 applications. I want people to be able to quickly come in and say, great, reuse this template, and now when I need to do a new version of Java for the SDK, I can do it once and apply that update to 100 applications rather than have to go chase 100 different apps and force them to upgrade, right, because it's been inconsistent. Ultimately, when you think about this at scale, it's really about managing you know, cost of operations and operational efficiency. And it's about managing risk, right? And risk comes in a few different buckets. It could be security risk because you have unpatched vulnerabilities. It could be operational risk because things aren't well configured or you're deploying with N equals one and you know, there's no HA story at play, things like that. So ultimately, if I can consider the risk and cost components into the design of my golden patterns and actions and to apply it consistently, that's the benefit for my ops team. I don't have to think about it a hundred different ways. I think about it one way and then I apply it to all of the users of it, right? So that really becomes the goal. So really Waypoint sits as sort of providing this sort of an internal developer platform capability, right? Really focused on golden pattern, golden action at the heart of it. And really doing this by having tight integration with things like Terraform Cloud in terms of how we're defining these patterns as code and then automating the execution of them, right? So ultimately that's kind of the goal. You know, and it all starts, you know, really at the heart of that becomes the sort of service catalog concept where you're creating the app as really the sort of primary object, if you will, right? The, the sort of foo application here is what we're modeling. The infrastructure really is in service of that application, right? And that's really more of how the application teams think about it versus how infrastructure tends to think about it, which is sort of infrastructure up rather than sort of application down. So hopefully this was helpful and gives a little bit of an overview of some of the features and capabilities of Waypoint. I hope you found this useful.